Today, uh, my name's Saeed. I, I work for Mimecast as a senior sales engineer. And what we're going to go through today is really, in essence, the work protected message. And that's really the intersection between our communication, our people, and our data. So over the last two years, two and a half years, we've all gone through something together. And that's been COVID, the lockdown and being at home where in essence, we've all been segregated from each other, at least physically. And as a consequence, an emphasis has, has effectively elaborated um, on our emails and our collaboration tools in order for us to work um, going forward. And that's really where work happens these days, our work surface. It's also where our risk now lies within our emails, our collaboration services, and that suite of solutions and products that we now rely on to do our work. It's, and I guess we have to ask ourselves, why is it the riskiest place for us now? And if you think about it in detail, think about your own environments, your own workplaces, and where data sits. It's going to be in your emails, it's going to be in your Slacks or your Microsoft Teams or whatever solution that you have in place that's holding that critical data for your organization. So the fundamental question we have to ask our security teams is how has this work surface become our largest uh, risk and attack surface? And that's really where we need to start thinking about our organizations from a security standpoint. And this really takes the, the, the people, the communication, the data into consideration the most, and that attack the attack vectors. You've got your malicious attack, attacker outside in, motivated to gain information, to install ransomware, potentially even uh, start an attack and move laterally within your organization. That may well be uh, a contractor coming into your offices that it starts off with, with a, an infected machine, plugs into the network, that now that person can now move laterally within your organization. You then have your employee error. And this happens from time to time. Employees click on links without knowing what they're doing necessarily. We, we just had a session, if you were in the room, on uh, human error and, and, and cybersecurity. Um, and so how do we protect our employees from doing these types of things, whether it's knowingly or unknowingly? And we all like to think we don't have it, but the insider threat is also real. We have disgruntled employees that potentially could be someone that we need to think about, at least from a, a risk and a... Uh, 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 from a risk surface perspective. And lastly, we have technology fallibility. Now, when was the last time your exchange service went down or a service that you rely on or your organization relies on went down for a period of time that was impactful to your organization? Now, I'm not looking for hands. You don't need to admit, admit who went down and what, what happened, but we've all been there. I can probably almost guarantee that we've all been there at some point in our careers. And again, how does that impact us as an organization? Do we lose money? Is, is it revenue-based impact that, that's hitting the bottom line? And what can be done about it? So I'm sure everyone's seen this slide or a, a similar slide of 91% of breaches starts with email. Um, this particular stat was from Verizon's latest uh, DBIR report, and everyone else has something similar in the 90s, high 90s. And why, you might ask? Well, it's the easiest way to get into your organization. Why would I want to start to learn or identify what network devices you have at your perimeter when I can just send an email and hope that someone clicks? And if you think about it, it's a numbers game. You've got large attack surfaces with Microsoft, Google, and others that if I can curate the right phishing page and send it to all those customers and those users, there's going to be a percentage that click. So really, no, long are the days of finding vulnerabilities in systems, which can happen. It goes back to that whole te technology failure. If you've got technology that has vulnerabilities within it, 
attackers will take advantage of it because they've identified the, those vulnerabilities in advance. And we see the impact of these every single day, whether it's those malicious attackers, employees, and not to name any names, but we saw one quite recently about how uh, an employee received an email and clicked on the link. Not talking about any driving companies out there whatsoever. Um, and then you've got technology failures. And again, it could be things like a Microsoft engineer turning off the wrong set of servers, assuming that they're to be decommissioned, which creates a, a knock-on impact to other organizations. And it is a multifaceted problem, right? Um, you've got your impersonation attacks, your supply chain compromise, not only the domain that can be impersonated, but the, the, the person's name. So think about your CEO or your CFO in your organization. That person can be impersonated quite easily. Um, think about your supply chain. Now, it might be quite easy to identify whether your CEO or CFO has emailed into your organization because there'll be that, um, there'll, there'll be that education, I guess. But when it comes to your supply chain, that becomes slightly harder. When you've got hundreds of, of, of suppliers, maybe your finance team receive, receiving invoices, how are you to identify what's right and what's wrong when it's come from third party? You now not need to kind of up your game in terms of your knowledge of supply chain attacks. You've got user credential theft. Again, talked about in the previous session, when someone clicks on a link, assuming that it's something safe, and then they've been taken to a logon page and they enter their credentials unknowingly to them that they've just shared their credentials with an attacker. And the attacker isn't necessarily going to do something with those credentials straight away. They could sell it to the dark web. They could use it as a lateral attack for later on. And, and that would be the most sophisticated attacker where they're utilizing your credentials at a later date in order to remain undetected and continue out their attack. And it may be that for a period of six months to a year that you're you're, you just don't know that it's happened. They may be logging into your emails to identify what's happening. How important are you to your organization? What level of access do you have? What level of information do you have? So really the risks can ramp up when it comes to credential harvesting. You then have attack spreading laterally. We talked about that earlier on within your communication platforms. It's no longer a case that attacks all come through email and so therefore let's look at email, protect email when we're good. They can laterally move across to different areas of your business, whether it's Slack or even to the web, receiving a link from somewhere and, and, and then accessing it on the web. And then you've got the data. Of course, ransomware is something that is, again, real. Probably less of you have probably experienced it within the room, but it happens quite often and it still does today. It was the the thing to talk about all the time a couple of years ago, but we talk about it less, but it's happening still all the time. Data is still being encrypted by the attackers and, and ransomware okay. ransom is being paid in order to access it. Um, and, that, and, and it's a case of identifying that as a problem and trying to think about a solution past it. So what has the industry done? So the industry has looked at these problems and they've responded and they've reacted. And actually, commendably, many of the organizations outside have a real solution that they are responding to and resolving, whether that's email security based, awareness training, training based, archiving discovery, discovery or even DMARC management. However, this has created a proliferation of point solutions. Okay, so you've got experts in different areas providing solutions, which are great, which work really well. But when that is combined with your organization and your limited resource in managing that set of products, we then have another issue. Not only do we need to look at the risk surface, but now we've got the complexity of managing these point solutions um, across the board. So a question to you all, and, and this was supposed to be a bit of an interactive slide, but we can do without, without the interactivity of it. Raise your hand if you've got more than one of these solutions. Okay, a few hands. More than three? More than four? Okay, so I've got, uh, we got to about three there. 
which is an interesting number because it goes to a question of how do you manage that? Do you have multiple individuals within your organizations that are the experts within that solution? Or is it one person that you then train up, um, make sure that they, they're knowledgeable within those products and hope to God that they don't leave? What's the situation that you're in? Go past that. So that complexity talks to the challenges that security teams face. And hopefully some of these um, speech bubbles will be, will be um, reflective of what you see in your organization. Whether the total cost of these things are going through the roof and the board is asking you to cut cost, costs, um, whether it's difficult to translate that risk strategy to the board and asking for more money if you feel that's the thing that you need to do. Um, and maybe a feeling of the attackers being one step ahead all the time, not being able to feel agile enough to, to deal with the risk and you feel like you're ma managing the solutions that you have more than the actual risk itself. Cool. I'll pass that one. So, yeah, to, to continue that, the, the risk factors are compounded by that complexity that we've created ourselves. Now, it's almost a position that we're in a, a demarcation point of turning left or right. Do we continue down this road of adding complexity each time a new threat or risk comes by and we need to patch it? Or do we look back and think, okay, do we need to... Re Reevaluate where we're going from here. I think we've covered this one here as well. We can move on to the next one. So the question is, how do we tame complexity without compromising our security so we can work protected? And that's really what I want to kind of move into now um, of, of how Mimecast deal with this. And that's where we introduce the Mimecast system. So protecting your communication, protecting your, your data and your people. And that's done through these three layers, your platform, mesh, as well as the suite. Now you're probably thinking, what's a mesh? Um, and I'll go through that in a second. Effectively, your, your X1 platform is the underlying platform that Mimecast provides you with. Something that's scalable, that has efficacy when it comes to solutions within it, that provides you a one-stop shop in order to be able to resolve those business problems that you face. The mesh, it, it stands for Mimecast Extensible Security Hooks. And in short, that's connecting to other security vendors via APIs. So the Mimecast API program is free. We do not charge you a penny for any connectivity that you have with like-minded other vendors. An example might be that you have someone like CrowdStrike, an endpoint solution uh, product. Well, why as a security vendor at Mimecast should we not be sharing our threat intelligence that we know about through, through email with someone who provides endpoint solutions? And that example is proliferated across many, many different vendors. So threat Sharing is important to us. Um, it's a responsibility, I think, more than just important. Um, and, and that's achievable through the mesh. Um, and then you have a suite of products. So we talked about those complex number of things that resolve DLP issues, uh, user training issues, email security issues. We provide many of those solutions within our suite of solutions that are not only just a suite, but they, they're interoperable with each other. So they're providing benefits to each other. For example, email and web. If you're, protect, if you're, if you're blocking a, a, an email based on a domain name that you no longer trust or is, 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 is spam, for example, then surely you don't want the, your users to be going to that domain name. So it's that type of connected logical thinking that we apply to our suite of products. So in essence, 
the Mimecost system um, of, of advanced email and collaboration suites allows communications to be trusted. That's the goal, that's the aim and the goal. It allows the people to be savvy through some of those, uh, uh, I guess, user awareness or awareness training solutions that we have, as well as our data being safe in terms of the location that it's at, the copy of data that we have in order to protect you from the things, from things like ransomware. Any questions? So I'll move on from the Minecraft system to, I guess, a journey that many customers make. Um, some of you may have already made it. Um, in fact, let me ask, uh, how many of you are Mimecast customers? Not bad, shall we? Good. Um, I'll, I'll, I've got sales documentation here. If you, anyone else wants to sign up, then just let me know. Um, so many customers start off with uh, the 365 Protect, which provides email security, threat protection, uh, cybergraph, and internal email protect. Um, the next step often is to add things like archiving security or archiving availability, continuity, um, so that even if your emails do go down, you have a backup plan. You have the ability to still send and receive emails from your Outlook sessions without having to worry about not receiving that big deal that you've been working on for so long um, from your Outlook session rather than logging into another platform. And then you've got some other Ex, uh, extensions to our products, things like DMARC management tools, um, awareness training. You've got your cloud archiving for email and Teams. So again, as, as we progress through time, it's not just emails that we need to be wary of when it comes to archiving from a compliance standpoint, from a security standpoint. It's things like the conversations in Teams, conversations in Slack, conversations in these types of tools that need to be secure. And it's not just specific to finance houses that need it from a, from a compliance standpoint. It really does go across the industries as well. You then got the modular uh, capabilities when it comes to protecting your communication, <coughs> protecting your data, and protecting your people. And, and I won't go through all of these now but um, it's something that you can get off me after this session today. I'll build this up first and foremost. Cool. So really the way that you may consider Mimecast is through these three things. It's a case of making sure that you have fast implementation and we have two deployment uh, methods for that, technical support that you, you, you have from us, but also your continued success. One of the key things that we differentiate ourselves at Mimecast with is the way that we provide a aftercare service. You may buy services from us today that you may not implement. And for us, that's a concern because you're not getting the value that you originally envisaged that you'll have. And that may be for multiple different reasons blockers within your organization, change control, um, maybe just the knowledge thing that you, you wasn't quite sure what to configure and how to configure it. So we have customer success teams uh, there in order to help you progress and make sure that your journey with Mimecast, no matter if it's your first 30 days, 60 days, or even two years, that you, you're utilizing the services that you've bought. We Past that one, and I guess this is the next thing that I wanted to kind of touch upon. Um, it says coming soon, that's here. And in fact, I'm gonna to go to the next slide, which depicts what I wanna talk about. Um, traditionally, Mimecast and other email security solutions required you to change your MX records um, from Microsoft or Google uh, directly to us in order for us to scan that mail in the, I guess the, the gateway um, model uh, before we then send it back to your mail platform to send to you as a user. And that still works. That's still alive. That's your classic SEG service, secure email gateway service. You then have the cloud integrated 
deployment method that's now uh, the new thing on the block. Effectively, from a Mimecast standpoint, it's exactly the same security, but with a different deployment method. It effectively means that your main mail platform, Microsoft, Google, you create a routing rule in order to send that email to Mimecast. Mimecast does the scans, sends it back to you to send to your user. So effectively, you have less um, change control that you'd need to go through internally, and you can turn on security within four minutes, in essence, from this particular solution. And that's really to avoid those or, or to support those issues that we find when it comes to having teams internally to build and support technologies like Mimecast. And that's it from me today. Thank you very much.